Vera, welcome to Ocean 17. Thank you. Happy to Straight be Straight from Hamburg. You bring like so many memories to me. I mean, I lived in Hamburg for two years. It was like a great time in my life. But uh, how does it feel to be in Vegas? Well, I mean, Hamburg and Vegas is, it can't be more <laughs> opposite, right? Is it, right? <laughs> well, a little bit, a little bit. Ripper Bond Street. Is it a little bit like, you know? Yeah. It, it kind of gives you a Vegas feeling, just a little bit. Sometimes. I mean, Ripper Bond, you might probably know. Yeah. Ripper Bond. Ripper what, Bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my accent again, the way, but that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we're going to go through seven questions, like in seven seas, I'm going to cross your ocean. So let's start with the first one, okay? Okay. In 1977, the Sex Pistols play one of punk's most awesome pranks on the establishment by showing up via boat to the Queen of England Silver Jubilee celebration. They serenaded the celebrants God Save the Queen to promote their record, never mind the bollocks. <laughs> it was a performance act like no other and a true breakthrough of the status quo. When the police inevitably forced their way onto the boats, they arrested Marco McLaren, the band's manager. I like to think that the Sex Pistols chose to be on a boat because water was the cathartic power to clean everything up. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure the boats and the river Thames were only the right platform at the right time. Do you think that music videos in the past MTV era are still platform to make loud statements or society is shaped in a way that we're never gonna get back to that kind of like, you know, messaging in music? Well, um, I feel there is still the possibility of using a music video for mm -hmm. that. But of course, with all the social media short formats we have right now, from starting from TikTok on, right. Um, it's so diverse what people look and uh, use. Um, it's not so easy to get the message through, I would say, with a music video. But, um, I mean, thinking of what could be an example um, of the past, I don't know, one or two years, I remember what, um, This Is America, the video from um, yes, Childish Gambino. Yes, I do remember Childish Gambino. That's a good example. That's, That's I, a good example. I, 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 I love the music. I also love the message. And um, It was a statement. And I remember when it came out, it was like very loud. Yeah. A loud statement. And it, I mean, it also won a lot of prizes because it was so, um, yeah, it, uh, it took the power mm -hmm. of a music video to be political and... Yeah, Point it was definitely fingers. an establishment. Yeah. You know what I loved about Hamburg? No. Nope. There are certain parts of Hamburg, and maybe because, like, you know, the agency where I was, like, in San Paoli, yeah. had that kind of anti-establishment vibe. Yeah, it's true. Well, um, I think that changed also with... It changed. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of, like, uh, these agencies are now also owned by big corporate... Yeah, sure. Corporations, um, yeah, it's not so. Look, the six degrees of freedom are what naval architect called the six different motion floating vessel make. Ships as seas heave, sway, surge, roll, pitch, and yo. The first three are linear motions, mm -hmm. while the other three are rotating motions. When I discovered this fact, I pose a smile because I picture a boat going a storm <laughs> and these six different way to move. And I thought that six degrees of freedom is the perfect definition. Bridget this to advertising during production. <laughs> producer a boat caught in a storm of challenges. Do you try to go linear and stay focused? or rotate into chaos before finding your way out of the store. <laughs> Let me first ask you, do you have a boat license? I don't have a boat license, but because of this podcast that has been going for like uh, okay. three years, I gather like an invaluable knowledge about boats and oceans and like, you know, I'm not a big fan of boat because I get very easily seasick, okay. but I'm fascinated by it. 
Okay. So I because I'm just trying to get a boat license. That's why I got <laughs> confused what question is coming up now. So you try to go linear or you embrace chaos? Well, I'm, uh, I, that's my, I, I started as a producer. That's my, my that's a job I love uh, and um, I still do. So um, there is, there is, that's what I love about the job is every project is different. So sometimes, and it also depends on the director, uh, it depends on so many things if it's, uh, if you can go linear or if you can't. Right. And so you usually, I mean, that's, I follow my instinct and um, sometimes I go with the flow. And <laughs> Are you anxious as a person? What, you don't know me, what, how do you, do you think I, I... It's so difficult to say, because I think, like, uh, I need to see you, like, under pressure, but I already thought that, no. so, like, to be a producer... Yeah. I, I could never, like, function as a producer, because I'm very anxious as a person, so even, like, uh, you know, like, deadlines, or, like, you know, ch even changing, like, a, 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 a stupid flight ticket, they would, like, you know, <laughs> drive me crazy. No, I'm... So, I, I do think that as a producer, you need to really, like, at least not be anxious as a person. You need to be cool, even, like, mostly under pressure. Because yeah, that's, that's what I am. Things that change. I mean, usually, uh, the more pressure I have, the calmer I get. No way. And that's yeah. also in your personal life, not just mm, on the work. I don't... I ask my children, they would probably say <laughs> something else. <laughs> so how are you able to separate these two universes? I don't know. It's just how uh, it's a natural thing. I've, it, I I didn't uh, do any training or something. I just that's how I get. If it's really, I mean, if it's really stressful and um, timing is uh, or the timings are tight and a lot of stuff hap stuff happening and right. not going well, then I. So would you say that there are two Vera out there? One that works. As a 100%. producer and the one that uh, yeah. is a mom and like in yeah. the family. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even both sides. Sometimes my children, when they listen how I talk, <laughs> they say, why are you, I mean, can you be as friendly to me as you are? <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally borderline. I love it. <laughs> no, because you didn't clean up your room a hundred <laughs> times when I was asking you. <laughs> if we think that computers didn't exist before Apple or Microsoft, we need to think again. Between 1900 and 1901, researchers discovered a 2,000-year-old computer called Antikythera off the Greek island with the same name. It is the earliest form of a computer seen on the planet. It is an analog computer that was built to serve several purposes. One of those purposes includes predicting astronomical eclipses and positions on the calendar. The inventor of this ingenious instrument was Hipparchus, an astronomer born in what is now Turkey. It is amazing to me to observe how the ocean brings back to life inventions and inventors after centuries of darkness. If you had the power of the ocean, Mm -hmm. And you were to bring one inventor back to life, who would it be a why? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, directly comes to my mind uh, also probably because the film ju um, just got released is um, Oppenheimer. Mm, okay. But I, it has nothing to do with filmmaking, but... Uh, uh, seeing what the world is uh, or what's happening in the world right now, I would love to bring him back and make this his invention undone. Undone. Yeah. Hmm. It's probably something you didn't want to hear, but uh, no, no, it, I sent it, it, that gets me straight think, into my. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think about the movie? Um, I haven't seen it. You haven't seen no. it. No. So I, I would love to, but uh, I mean, I've read so many things about it. I actually spoke about it yesterday to my friend, and uh, she said it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's worth it's it. Worth. You it's saw definitely it? definitely worth it. Yeah. I did see it, yeah. But I don't want to spoil it for you. And like, you know, of course, everything from Christopher Nolan is like, it just like yeah. off the chart. So I'm particularly obsessed with him. Uh, but I think like this time is something that, I would say it came out at the right timing. Yeah. Like, you know, involuntarily, I don't know if it did, like, you know, but it truly, like, something that speaks, like, to the time we are living. 
uh, even something that happened in the past, but uh, somehow he has that kind of ability to penetrate our present and really make yeah. you feel something, uh, you know, anyway. Yeah. This is a story made of a transatlantic trip and a harsh question. Returning from Hollywood to Dublin, Richard Burton, the movie star nominated for an Academy Award seven times and recipient of BAFTA and Golden Globes, walked into a pub and found his father, <laughs> an old beat up miner, reading the paper. And the old man looked at Richard and said, I read that they pay you thousands of pounds a day. And Richard nodded. And the man, confused, looked at Richard and said, what for? <laughs> <laughs> Advertising can be cynical, but one thing is certain. Once one has reached a certain level, the high salary is hard to be justified. Did it ever happen to you that someone had that kind of reaction in your family and truly say, what do they actually really pay you for? <laughs> well, uh, no. No, it's rather the opposite. If you ask my children, for example, they would say they, that I'm underpaid mm. because, uh, first thing, because they don't get enough pocket money, I guess. <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, but also on the other hand, uh, they grew up with me and mm -hmm. also my husband who works in um, working 24-7. Like, okay. um, we have had never ever a holiday where there was not a job thing going on. So, yes. Um, Does this bring regret, the fact that you guys never had a holiday where the job was never involved? I mean, it seems like working 24-7 is I love my job. So I it's not a job. No, it, well, yeah, yeah. Probably it's not a job. I love my job, uh, and I also I always felt that um, I uh, that my children seeing this that money I, I mean somebody has to work for it. It's not for granted. It's, not it's, for granted. it's yeah. not free. Yeah, nothing comes for free. And of course, I mean, if you uh, I feel bad. I especially felt bad in the pandemic seeing um, all the healthcare uh, people and still see how much money they earn, which is ridiculous compared to what I do. Um, but uh, I rather feel that they need to get more money than people. That's yeah. good. The Drunken Boat is a poem written in 1871 by Arthur Rimbaud. Arthur wrote the poem and sent it to Paul Verlaine to introduce himself. Shortly afterward, he joined Verlaine in Paris, and the duo became a force to be reckoned with. So here we are. A young writer sends one of his compositions to an already famous writer in hope of getting notice. Mm -hmm. It seems like a story that takes place in the creative industry in 2021, where thousands of young creatives are desperately trying to find a way to break through this industry. What advice would you give to a young kid that help, to help them stand out mm -hmm. from the crowd? Because I do think that nowadays it's harder to break through this industry. And it was easier back then. What kind of advice would you give? Well, I actually think it's easier because networking is so much easier. You think when, it's easier? Oh, that's so interesting. Because Yeah, because, I mean... When I started, um, the only thing I could do, I could beg people to please let me be at their side. But did you think that there were more, there were less jobs, there was lot less competition? Uh, there was a big competition. When I started but, my first internship, right. I think I competed against 5,000 uh, people wanting the same Maybe job. Maybe because I'm comparing it with the American market, because I, I began in 1998, yeah, so okay, okay. a long time ago. And uh, I actually too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and it was like in Rome. But when I see the way I broke through the industry, and when I see kids now yeah. in America, and maybe because they're totally different market, I can see that it's way difficult here. Um, okay. It was a little bit more natural before. I, I give an example. Yeah. Before you could go and beg someone. Make me, 
make me start. Like, yeah. you know, give me a chance. I don't, I don't want any money. Just let me be right. at your side. Right now, even a young kid that starts in advertising, at least in the United States, yeah. I don't know the European yeah. market, has to go through seven, eight rounds of interview. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, that's different. Yes. I would so, love people writing me or calling me and say, listen, uh, can I just come and, and visit your shoot? Can I just... Uh, that's what I love about Europe. I think that Europe has maintained a certain kind of freedom and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't even have the words of genuinity. Yeah. Uh, less corporate in general. Totally. Compared to America, where in America, trust me, it's so damn hard. Either you come from an advertising school and then you create your own connection through the advertising school. Otherwise, it's very difficult to stand out. It's very yeah. difficult. Or you know people, but normally on average, and that's something that uh, if you go LinkedIn, uh, at least on my LinkedIn page, because every LinkedIn account is an echo chamber because yeah, yeah. you're surrounded by your followers. Truly, like one of the biggest issues right now is like when you interview with agency, either you are young or you are like, you know, senior, you have to go through so many rounds of interview that it's like ridiculous, ridiculous. And the agency in America that ask you to do uh, work for free, just to show them, to prove them that you are good and valuable. Oh, wow. Yes. I mean, in Germany, of course, it's not allowed. You have of to. Of course. You, you, you can't. You have to pay. But... Um, uh, to answer your question, um, do you know the Art Directors Club in Germany? Of course. Yeah. yeah. For example, they have a mentoring program, um, which I, is really successful. People, like executives from the industry, they offer their time and advice mm -hmm. um, so that you can just um, apply and you get somebody who will take care of you and help you and advise you how you could, uh, oh, how to plan your Here's career. It. Here's the advice, move to Germany. <laughs> Here's well, the advice. Well, maybe, I don't Forget know. Forget the States, move to Germany. That's, that's a good well, advice. It's, maybe it's arrogant no, from my it side. No, it could be. I think, like, I don't think it's arrogant. Now, like, you know, of course, like, I, I say it as a joke, but I think one way to advise a young kid that would be don't just think United States. If you yeah. have the chance, the yeah, maybe that's a good advice. Why don't you start your career in Europe? So yeah. it's easier to break through, and you can gather like an international experience yeah. right away. So that could be a good example. A good yeah, advice. it's a very good advice, especially in Germany right now. There are so many international agencies. Mother just started. Anthony has so many like yeah international teams working on the different. I maybe that's the good thing coming out of here. The Lighthouse is a 2019 psychological horror thriller. I'm not, have you ever seen the movie? It's really good. Really? Yes, it's a really good okay. movie. Okay. With William Defoe. It oh, plays okay. like a very good role. Okay. The story is centered around two people who don't understand each other and find themselves guarding a lighthouse okay. on an isolated island off the coast of New England. The symbolism behind the plot is that the light at the top of the tower represents everything, the knowledge. And in looking into these lights, the two men can finally understand each other. They can break through the barrier of the language. Nice. Our creative industry seems to be going through a very uncertain phase. Nick Lowe, one of the persons that I had on my video podcast, believes that most of the agency today are baffled and don't know what to do. So I lead the big production. So I, I'm asking you, mm -hmm. as a producer, is there a light on top of the tower that can lead the big production companies to the future, or there is not? And everybody's there, like in the darkness. Um. Well, I would say that's probably a philosophical answer. Um, I would say trust is um, the biggest light for me. I've always trusted in myself and trusted in finding a new way, finding um, yeah the new tool. Of course, you probably wanted a different answer, like no, what? no, no. I want like <laughs> any any answer is like good. You know, it's like any answer is good for me. Uh, uh, 
but I feel that's that's one of the most important things you should get, and mm -hmm. uh, filmmaking will, uh, especially storytelling, I feel will never ever get old or uh, not not being wanted, and mm -hmm. therefore, if you, of course, we will have. I'm sure we will uh, produce um, artificial intelligent generated films, but still they need good people to produce that, to write, uh, even if there is also computer generated um, storytelling, I still feel you need the human touch at some point. Yeah. I and definitely agree with you. Yeah. Stories in themselves like, you know, will never die, of course. No. It's like the way you tell the story will change radically, but you have to have a story to tell, yeah. no matter what. Exactly. Yeah. You are the president of the category production and post-production music video here at the Los Angeles, uh, London International Awards. To me, part of your job is to make craft possible. Mm -hmm. We talk about craft and the importance of it, but we are less keen on talking about how to make it happen how you make craft possible. What criteria, criteria do you use to judge the best work in this category? Well, it's still, it's a combination of, of course it needs a great idea, yeah. the concept, the script, but also I feel I'm, the, be the best films are uh, the ones which have a human insight. Mm. And um, if this is well crafted, and that's, I mean, that's then uh, on my side and what I, what I love, if that's well crafted, then the combination of these three gets... Do you think that craft gets enough time these days, or yeah. everything feels like rushed, even in your universe? Like, uh, do you guys have enough time to craft what you want? No. To? You never have enough time. No. So you always, like have this feeling where when a job is completed you could have done better or you could, it could have been crafted better or? Well, so, sometimes for sure the timing is killing uh, possibilities right. because it, it starts with you don't get the right people. If you only have like a week or two to confirm the best crew, then of course you, you but it's probably not the first option you wanted to have. It's probably not... Uh, um, the location you wanted to get because you didn't have enough time uh, to think. But that's the nature we all have to yeah. work with, right? Vera, thank you so much for being aboard the Transatlantic and Ocean 17. Thank I mean, you. like, it was, was really fun. good, like, uh, sailing through. Yeah. And does the Queen Mary uh, ever sail from Hamburg? Yeah, right? Yeah. I think still, so. I remember, I remember I every so. year that we would go, like, down to the arbor. To see the Queen Mary sailing like uh, and do like the, the ocean crossing. Yeah, yeah. That's like a memory that I have. Nice. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, Vera. Thank you. That's good.